Präsident. Heute werden wir mehrere Sprachen sprechen, wie es bei uns in der Schweiz üblich ist. Before starting with our panels, it's my pleasure to give the floor to a guest of honor. He's Professor of Philosophy and Ethics of Information and Director of the Digital Ethics Lab at Oxford University. Luciano Floridi's research areas are the philosophy of information, information and computer ethics, and the philosophy of technology. Please welcome with an applause Professor Luciano Floridi. Buongiorno professore e benvenuto a Basilea. Grazie. Good morning. Madam President, Mr. President, uh, dear guest, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for this uh, invitation. It's not my first time in Switzerland and it's certainly not my first time in Basel. It's always a pleasure to come back here to learn. Not what I'm going to do in the next 30 minutes, but the rest of the day would be a learning opportunity for me because Switzerland is often seen abroad as a great lab where things are tried first and uh, where we can see what works and what uh, is success. So thank you very much. My task today is to, uh, I hope, entertain you, uh, but also share some ideas for about 30 minutes uh, or less um, on a vast topic. So I hope you will forgive me if I will be a little bit shallow, somewhat superficial. Uh, if I succeed, uh, then uh, you'll be left with more questions than answers. That's typical philosophy for you. We're good at asking questions, not so much, oh, we're working on the answers. We've been working for no, about 25 centuries. Give us a bit of extra time. The topic is how do we design this digital habit that, that is surrounding us? So um, in order to uh, make sure that we follow a path and I don't over speak, I will uh, rely on a little map. I shall discuss a little bit about this new habitat, this new environment, what it looks like. What are we really talking about when we talk about a digital environment? And then uh, one particular topic of many, and there are many, AI, artificial intelligence. What is it? And I shall try to convince you that is a divorce. It's not a marriage. It's a divorce between intelligence and agency. It's because we are divorcing these two entities and therefore we have gadgets and things that don't have to be intelligent in order to be successful in doing this and that, that we have artificial intelligence today. More on this as we move there. Once we have this divorce in mind, I will illustrate some of the ethical challenges that this divorce is causing. It's precisely because the gadgets we have are not intelligent that I don't sleep at night. If they were intelligent, I would be more relaxed. What does that mean for the environment, the real environment, the biological environment out there? Is this a force that we can uh, leverage to make a better job when it comes to global warming? That will be the specific point there. Moving therefore to once again, opening up the talk to governance, because that's what we need. You don't have technology full stop. The real challenge uh, is not, or no longer just technological or digital innovation. It's the governance of the digital. It's not what we invent, but what we do with the inventions that we have in our hands. That is the real challenge today. And finally, why this involves design. And not just because I'm Italian. Uh, I also have a British passport, just in case. I saw Theresa May coming. Um, but the design here uh, is what lies behind governance, which is the good way of handling technology, which is good for the environment. So we will back to the point. Now, this little map will come back uh, once we are halfway through. But let's talk about the new habitat. So we live on life. That's not a misspelled word. That's not a typo. Asking today someone whether he or she is online or offline means being from the 90s. I'm sorry for the people with white hair in the room. It's a question that I used to ask a long time ago. My students don't even know what the difference is anymore. Because at the moment you are here and your mobile phone is sending your geolocation uh, constantly, roughly uh, every minute, 
every app you have in that mobile phone. Are you online? Are you offline? You must be from the 90s if you think that that question has an answer. We are constantly online and offline at the same time. It's a mix and match. Therefore, we live in a space that is made of information and data. Again, not everywhere, and I'm constantly reminded that there are hundreds of millions of people who never made a telephone call. I know. But their life is determined by those who did make that telephone call. So when people say, oh, well, you must be really a Westerner, Oxford, not everybody lives in the infosphere. I know. But those who don't live in the infosphere yet have their lives decided by those who actually do. So let's not make any mistake. We are getting there. We are increasingly living a life. We are increasingly sharing a space that is made seamlessly of data and things, chairs and computers. The result is that um, this new habitat is a bit like a mangrove forest or a mangrove society, if you pass me the analogy. Now, mangroves, um, they don't grow in Oxford yet. Uh, uh, so we're not, global warming is not getting there yet. Uh, um, but where they grow, uh, they grow in this special environment. It's quite unique. You have the fresh water of a river and the salty water of the sea coming together. Asking there, is the water salty? Is it fresh? You, you don't know where you are, do you? It's a mangrove society. It's fresh and salty at the same time. So is it online? Is it online? Is it digital? Is it analog? It's a mix. And that's where the mangroves grow. And if, unless you realize that that's where the society is expanding, that everybody is coming to the mangrove society, you don't quite get the point. So I still have colleagues who say, oh, this is just a, no, it's a fashion, I remember in the 90s. Which I know, don't work on the internet, it won't last. Believe it or not. Luckily, sometimes young people don't listen. Um, or someone, oh no, it's all digital from now on. No, it isn't. Just look at what has happened in your kitchen. It's a bit digital, it's a bit analog, it's a bit online, it's a bit all live, et cetera, et cetera. You talk to gadgets, you say, shall we say, Alexa, what's the music, and so on. So the Mango Society is what's happening here. And it's a bit of a forest. It's a network that is kind of a jungle, but a beautiful one. Now, in this new habitat, in this new Mango Society, what happens to one particular topic? And there are many others, but let's talk about one of them. Artificial intelligence. Well, artificial intelligence uh, has been described in a thousand ways, and I know that experts here, computer scientists, will say, oh, but what do you mean symbolic AI, now deep learning, machine learning? You can't just say, yes, I can. Watch me. AI, okay? <laughs> so it's just a single thing, and you know when you see it. It's like pornography. You don't have a definition, it's a classic, and I'm not the first one to say that. Uh, you don't have a definition of pornography, but you recognize it when you see it. Now, artificial intelligence is a bit like that. Of course, journalists have to convey the point, so normally it's a robot. But most of the AI we have around, it's invisible to us. Ask people, not here in this room, but in the street, have you ever used AI? Oh, never. Now, did you take a good picture with your mobile phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Have you ever checked what is on Netflix and found that that recommendation was pretty good? Yes, absolutely. Well, that's AI too. And don't tell me you never bought something on Amazon that was not recommended. You like this, you may like that. Well, that's AI as well. So there's a lot of AI already percolating all over the place. We're using it on a daily basis, including warehouses. Now, why the warehouse here as a picture? Look what happens to that kind of space. We transform the space so that the robots inside can work successfully. In uh, industrial engineering, that is called an envelope. The envelope is the 3D space within which an artificial agent can operate successfully. The car industry know this you know, since the 70s. The warehousing industry is discovering it as we speak. They're not meant for us. They're meant for robots. So all of a sudden, uh, you have a discussion with your wife and you look at the sofa in the house and you say, we need to change the sofa. Uh, well, why? Well, because Roomba doesn't go under it. You know, that little disc that cleans the floor. And so all of a sudden, you have the sofa that is Roomba friendly. Well, Roomba didn't quite have a word, but almost, okay? So we say, well, Roomba like it? Is that a kind of thing that Roomba will enjoy? That? And in the end, you have a sofa that is 
chosen by you, your wife, and Roomba. Now, why is that important? Uh, it's, it's a serious topic, but we are transforming the world into something that is machine friendly. So when you look at a warehouse, you start wondering, what's gonna happen to my city? Because we are exporting the enveloping to our urban environment. And next time you hear, as I do when you talk to city council, say, I think we should have a special lane for driverless cars. Don't tell me that you are calling Roomba about the sofa. Are you transforming the city so that the city is machine friendly? What happens to us? So one of the problems here is because this AI is not that particularly intelligent, and it's a bit sort of stiff and sometimes you know, reluctant to change, etc. we make the environment friendly. The success of AI today is due to fantastic algorithms, massive, massive, massive amount of data, the fact that we live in the infosphere, so everything is happening in a digital environment, and we are transforming it to make sure that it's friendly to machines. Not to be underestimated next time you start doing some urban planning. So agency and intelligence are being divorced. That's why my iPhone plays chess better than anyone else in this room, for sure. Intelligence, zero. Ability at chess playing, total. What happened? We detached the two. If we had waited for the iPhone to be intelligent, to beat anybody at chess, I would still be having a great time. Unfortunately, I lose every day. So this divorce is causing, causing some challenges. Some of the challenges are obvious, some others are less obvious. Here is a quick map, and I hope it's uh, sufficiently big over there for those of you who are too far away. I will divide this into three groups, uh, the green, the red, and the amber. The green are the good things that can happen when you use AI. When you have the opportunities, you can enable human self-realization. You can enhance human agency. We can do more, better, differently. You can increase societal capabilities. It's extraordinary the services you can provide if you have the right AI. And you can cultivate societal cohesion. Now these are good things that we want, call it the green, not good stuff. Then we have the bad stuff. When we overuse or misuse AI, we devalue human skills, we remove human responsibility. How many times have you heard, sorry, what's the computer? Uh, reducing human control, delegating when we shouldn't, and eroding human self-determination. But it's also an amber corner, which again, as policymakers, as lawmakers, we should not underestimate. And that is underuse, the fear that you could make a mistake and therefore I'd rather not, better safe than sorry. Now, with that principle, remember, better safe than sorry, we will still be in a cave and that little thing called fire, mm, better safe than sorry, let's not adopt it. The will, I'm ah, not quite sure, no, let's not adopt it, better safe than sorry. So let's make sure that this amber corner doesn't play a role too big. In order to deliver on the green, avoid the red, and make sure that the amber doesn't stumble or block over there, we need some ethics. Well, often, uh, even yesterday, we had a lovely discussion over lunch and dinner. People say, oh, ethics, isn't the law enough? No, it's not. And uh, as an Italian, not as a British uh, citizen, let me use a football analogy. Rules of the game. That's what the law provides. You do not play this game unless you comply with the rules. If you don't, you get a ticket and so on. But that doesn't mean winning the game. Otherwise, I would be a great tennis player. Now, playing according to the rules, why I not win? Because you need a strategy. You need to do more over and above compliance with the rules. Rules are the essential. You don't even start talking without rules in place. But what can I do to do more that's what ethics does. So ethics is the more, the extra, and it happens when you need to shape the law, because maybe there isn't a law about, say, face recognition or drones next to an airport. What's the ethical debate we're having as a society in terms of what we prefer, what we would like to have? Then you have law that doesn't cover corners. That's an ethical debate as well. We have vague or gray areas covered but not so much by the law. And there are things not covered at all, not even now, not even in terms of a debate. In all these areas, that's what we need to do. 
to decide what we like, what we don't, what we think is right or wrong, what should be done and shouldn't. So don't forget, you may do something and that something may still be totally wrong. See what Boris Johnson is doing with the parliament. You may still do it and it's still totally wrong. <laughs> governance is something else. Um, governance is the extra. So normally we, we use these words, law, regulations, ethics, governance, to mean what needs to be done, what is the right, what is the right thing to do. But let me introduce a little concept here of soft ethics. This is normally what happens when you talk to a big company. The lawyers come in in the board and say, Professor Floyd, but we have plenty of lawyers. We have gazillions of lawyers. Why do we need to do ethics? Well, rules of the games, football, etc. And then you start telling them, look, what you need is to do post-compliance ethical thinking. Compliance is the requirement. Don't get even close to not compliance. You must be joking, especially in Europe. And I'm talking not European Union, I'm talking Europe. We are pretty much on the good side of decent laws here in this corner of the world. Compliance is required. Human rights, well, maybe you don't even believe in them, but make sure that at least formally you respect them. The rest is an open space. What more, what extra can be done to make sure that we live in a better society? And I like to think that enormous agents called corporate multinational agents, they better have a bit of ethical thinking in their minds. Compliance is not good enough. And you tell them that uh, it's like football. Play according to the rules, you end up like the British team. At this point, normally, there is another sort of objection. Okay, what new habit heard? Okay, on life, on sphere, not so many words, okay, fine, but I'm getting it, and okay, we need some ethics, law is not enough. But ethics, well, there are so many ethics. Ethics are, ethics is, in English, okay? So it's like mathematics. It has an N uh, with an S, it's unfortunate, but it's a singular word. Ethics is, and always been is. In other words, it takes a long time, we need to work hard, but sooner or later we converge around a few basic principles. Is that the word of a philosopher? Should you believe me? No. Here is facts. So this is uh, a recent work that we did with one of my graduate students, brilliant uh, Josh Kautz, um, a comparison of some of the most important ethical frameworks for artificial intelligence in the world. I'd like to call your attention to the bottom three because they're the most important for us for today. One is the uh, European Commission uh, high-level expert group. I'm one of the members. We uh, delivered a framework which essentially um, was based on these five fundamental principles. Beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, justice and explicability. The OECD uh, inherited that work very recently and adopted pretty much the same framework. Mind that, uh, for those of you who were not there at uh, the right time, Switzerland is one of the founding uh, countries of the uh, OECD. Beijing followed suit and adopted almost, autonomy being a little bit more touchy over there, um, almost no, the same kind of framework. So there's a m massive convergence around this. And it's still high level, there's still a lot of work to be done. But I hate to hear people saying, oh, my ethics, your ethics, ethics are, we will never agree seriously. So in what country is a good idea to have child pornography? And if there is such country, well, the answer is simply wrong. Not my ethics, your ethics, my view, your view. So there's a point when you stop talking about one hand and the other hand, and you know, there's a lot of convergence. That convergence needs to be translated into practices. It's not good enough to say, oh, we have very lofty, high-level, great principles and uh, job done. No, of course, it has to be translated into policy making, law making, and direct practices every day. Now, that's where the specific topic uh, kicks in uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes or 15 or so. Of the many things that we could do with AI, it seems obvious, uh, at least for anyone who reads newspapers these days, well, the right newspapers, I suppose, not the ones that Trump reads, no, ah, the good newspapers, um, that, that we're not doing a good job in handling this little thing called planet Earth. Uh, in fact, if anything, uh, you hear sometimes people saying, oh, the digital technologies, are they making us more stupid? And you just wonder, w in comparison to what? <laughs> because, uh, you know, we, we just came from two world wars and, and, the, and the destruction of Earth. So it's not that the past generations have done such a you know, royal job, uh, have they? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be more, very difficult to be more stupid than that. Uh, you know, and it's 
still living memory. So two world wars, you know, concentration camps, Nazism, fascism in my own country, an earth that is almost destroyed, and, oh, the digital is making us stupid, really. Well, hopefully, it will actually make us a little bit less stupid by let us know what's going on. If we know so much about the Amazonian or the Siberian or the African fires, it's also because we have those pictures, satellite, people talking all over the place, sometimes even on Facebook, if they forget their cats. So the environment is burning, uh, and in that context, the natural and the artifactual are the best ally. So I spoke to you about a divorce. That is a historical moment. We are divorcing for the first time in the history of humanity on this planet, the ability to perform a task successfully in view of a goal from any need to be intelligent. Not even biological intelligent, not even a dog, a horse, or a slave, no, uh, when Aristotle was around. Now, we have gadgets that can do that. For us, instead of us, better than us. Are we going to use them properly to save the other half? And that's where the marriage should happen. So that divorce between agency and intelligence should lead to, shall we say, a fantastic marriage between technology and nature, the natural and the artifactual. We don't come from that particular tradition, but we can get there. So we will leave, and this is a topic for this afternoon as well, in increasingly complex environments. This is uh, the urban population, uh, and it's pretty much uncontroversial data. Uh, cities like uh, Sao Paulo, uh, London, Tokyo, uh, and so on, Los Angeles, will be the norm, with millions and millions of people living in the same environment. The complexity there will be astounding. Do we need all the artificial intelligence we can possibly put together to manage those uh, contexts? Of course, that is the kind of marriage we want. That is the kind of technology we need to have. We're also destroying this planet. That's the global warming, and that is also uncontroversial, no matter what Trump-like people think. So as we boil to death on this planet Earth, surely our technology needs to be geared, leveraged to make a difference. And it's not nature against technology, but it's technology for nature. This is what we have somewhat misunderstood in the past. A long time ago, say my parents' generation, um, we used to have a still a circular economy. And in some corners, in a small village where I spend you know, holidays, uh, summertime, uh, south of Rome, uh, there's still that sense of not throwing away a bottle because he will need that for your sauce in the winter. Not because you are green, but because you don't throw away anything. There's nothing to throw away. So it used to be a circular economy, poor. Technology transformed that into a linear economy, rich. We bought fridges. But you buy a fridge, you use a fridge, you throw away a fridge, you buy another one. On and on and on and on again. At some point, there are too many fridges thrown away, and you don't know what to do with all those fridges, all those cars, all those things. And so what we need to move to is circular as for millennia, because there was nothing to throw away, but rich, as in recent past, can be done. It's called circular economy. And I know Switzerland is at the forefront here. The confusion is that some people in the green area think, oh, oh technology was the problem, therefore it's still the problem. No, the problem was analog technology at the time. We had to lift ourselves out of poverty. That's how you know, the linear economy helped us. Now we can afford to be circular. How? Through digital technology. Efficiency, efficacy. That's what AI can bring by the bucket. What we don't have much is the bottom variable, time. We need to speed up, again, because this place is boiling. So at this point, putting all the pictures together, we should have a way of combining A with B, all those principles at the European level, at the OECD level, even in Beijing, to make sure that we move from a, a linear rich to a circular rich economy. We need to do that by using AI to make sure that the green bits of AI, the, the, the good stuff, not the red, not the amber, lead to a good environment. Can it be done? Yes. Are we doing it? No. What's the difference? Governance. 
coordination. And that's why Switzerland is normally seen as a great lab. You, you guys do a lot of coordination here. Uh, now, we can learn a lesson or two at a European level. Uh, how do you put together so many different minds you know, around the same policy? So, the next topic, and we're almost there, the last uh, eight minutes. Governance. Behind all this, and as I told you, you know, a new environment, new forms of life, a new form of agency here, which is not necessarily intelligent, but certainly very you know, efficient, very efficacious. It delivers if we use it properly. We have a problem on one hand, the environmental problem, we have a solution on the other, we need to put them together. That divorce can lead to a great marriage. Divorce agency from intelligence, that's what we've been doing as engineers, combine that detached agency that is our own power, within our power to handle, to a problem that needs all the effort we can possibly make. That is something that starts getting exciting. When people say, oh, there's nothing to do anymore in this world, you know, we, no. no, what's the European project? Well, for example, uh, saving the world, that sounds exciting. Uh, <laughs> governance is what is missing. Well, governance can be understood in a thousand ways, but what I mean here is the classic sense of governance, control and direction. It comes from Plato, so it has long roots. When Plato needs to talk about governance, he talks about a kibernetis. The kibernetis, the Greek word, means pilot of the ship. The pilot of the ship has this ability, knows where to go, that which is crucial, and is a good sort of target, but handles currents and winds in such a way that even if they are against and unfavorable, he will deliver the right journey. So sometimes the pilot has to go left and right and even backwards in order to move forwards. That's politics. That's politics capital P. It's not just bargaining, not just not making sure that you're still in power. So at that stage, populism, from a platonic perspective, is follow the wind, go with the current. That's not politics. Politics is necessarily anti-populist because it uses the winds and the currents to go where we should be going sometimes in an unpopular way at the beginning. Look, we wanted to go there. Why are you going? Well, because I have to negotiate the winds and the currents to get there, and you don't know, but let me, no, try. Trust me that I will lead you there. That's the great politician. We don't have many of them, uh, certainly not in London at the moment, uh, but you know at least what you were looking for. Uh, so good governance, all of a sudden, is not just handling stuff, it's managing. Oh, by the way, look at the etymology of the two words. Handling, no, that's the hand, and the manus, the Latin word from management. You're still doing things almost physically with your hands. It's just that the ropes and the ceiling is going to be done in view of a clear target, which leads us to the next point. I told you the new challenge today for places like Switzerland, the UK, uh, Europe at large, it's not so much technological innovation. We have that by the bucket. We still you know, would be thinking in terms of last decade if you thought, oh, we need to invest 100% in technology innovation, when in fact we don't know what to do with it. The real challenge, the difficult thing, is not to buy one more startup, as anyone can do, I mean, certainly Facebook, but to know exactly what to do properly. And that is much more. Difficult than investors say $10 million in this on that. The governance of the digital, that's where we as humans need to invest. At that point, design is everything. By design, what I mean is having a project. So what I've been telling you for the last no, 25 minutes or so is quite simple. We have a new habitat. The habitat is full of forces, one of which is AI. AI is a divorce but that divorce can work for us if we make it also a marriage. We divorce agency from intelligence. We marry together that strong agency with environmental problems to provide a solution through what looked like initially a problem. How do we do that ethically? Well, law is just necessary, is insufficient. We need more, we need to win. We just don't need to play according to the rules. That's not enough. Necessary, insufficient. Fine, how do we implement that? Well, governance, that's what good governance does. It takes a view of where you want to go and maneuvers, handles, manages no, the winds and the currents 
to get there. But you need to have a sense of where you're going. And that's where design plays a fundamental role. Without a clear design of what is the human project we want to implement, there is no governance, there is no politics, there is no divorce, marriage, all that thing becomes a matter of handling the present, making sure that the ship doesn't sink, which is good enough at some point, but not sufficiently exciting in terms of having a direction. So we need a human project. And what is the best human project you can think of today? The green and the blue. I told you already, and that's the end of my little presentation. We need to make sure that these digital technologies in the new habitat are friendly towards work for the green issues that we have. So the blue of digital technologies combines with the green of economics, social issues, environmental issues, to form something that would be the 21st century for us. This would be our project. It wouldn't be something we inherited from past generations. We wouldn't still be saying, oh, Europe is great because we defeated the Nazis. That was 80 years ago. There's no little kid today that gets excited by that. It's history. They read that on the history book. You need to tell them, there's a fight. We can win it. And this is how we can win it. It will require sacrifices, but it's also something that people can get excited about. The digital age is the age of design. We know that. It's not the age of invention. It's not the age of discovery. We need discoveries. We need inventions. But we need to design you know, what we do with this. It should be the age of good design. That is the challenge that we need to raise to as a current generation. Thank you. Grazie mille, professor Floridi. Grazie mille, professor Floridi. Rimanga con noi anche per il primo panel della nostra mattinata. Grazie, arriviamo subito da lei. Und jetzt kommen wir zum ersten Panel unserer Konferenz. Das Hauptthema lautet Für die Macht der Maschine zu Ohnmacht der Menschen. Ein spannende Thema. Genau, bevor wir loslegen, habe ich aber eine Frage für unser Publikum. Und zwar, wer hat heute alles ein Smartphone dabei? Hände hoch. Wer hat alle ein Smartphone? Ja. Gut, jetzt kommt die interessantere Frage. Wer hat keines dabei? Ja, Sie trauen sich fast nicht. Ich sehe eine Dame. Ich respektiere Ihren Mut, dass Sie das Haus verlassen ohne ein Handy. Vielleicht ist sie auch obdachlos, um das anzusprechen, was unser Bundespräsident gesagt hat betreffend den Smartphones, die unser Haus darstellen. Jetzt können Sie alle Ihr Haus in die Hände nehmen, weil Sie werden sich jetzt einloggen, am liebsten auf slido.com. Das wäre super, wenn Sie das machen könnten. Sie können danach den Hashtag DS19 eingeben und damit sich einloggen. Und folgende Frage beantworten, die dann zum Panel auch passt. Sie lautet, führt die Macht der Maschinen zur Ohnmacht der Menschen? Was denken Sie, ja oder nein? Geben Sie doch Ihre Antwort jetzt auf Ihrem Handy ein und dann sehen wir hier direkt, 32 Leute sind super schnell gewesen und die meisten sagen nein, okay. Das wird spannend. Ähm, liebe Jada, ich hoffe, dass du das dann aufnehmen kannst und äh, beim Panel mit unseren Gästen diskutieren wirst. Und wir sehen uns gleich. Bis gleich. Vielen Dank, Tamara. Dankeschön. Es ist mir äh, eine Ehre, unsere Gäste vorzustellen, Mrs. Mitchell Baker, She co-founded the Mozilla project to support the open, innovative web and ensure it continues offering opportunities for everyone. As chairwoman of Mozilla, Mitchell Baker is responsible for organizing and motivating employees and volunteers who are building the internet as a global public resource, open and accessible to all. That's very important. Please welcome Mrs. Mitchell Baker. And our next guest, Martina Irayama, since 2019, Switzerland State Secretary of Education, Research and Innovation, Vice President of the Board InnoSwiss, Switzerland's Innovation Promotion Agency, member Swiss National Science Foundation's Foundation Council. Herzlich willkommen. And Martin Fetterli, President of Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, Professor of Engineering at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, and former President of the National Research Council of the Swiss National Science Foundation. Herzlich willkommen.
Sehr geehrte Gäste, referring to Professor Floridi's speech, I'd like to hear your thoughts, your feelings about the following question. In many ways, digitization has destroyed certainties and left us with a world of incertitude and insecurity. Many people are beginning to have doubts. Do we still master technology progress? What are your thoughts, Mrs. Baker? Well, I think we're in the very early phases. <coughs> so I think we will master technology, um, but I think the timing is really unclear. I also think that, that history, you, you talked about Plato, but I, I might start with something closer. The Industrial Revolution gives us some background on what things look like. You know, technology will change society. Uh, even after the marriage, like what we look like and even our perceptions probably of time or space or communities, they're, they're going to be different. Our perceptions today aren't the same as the 1800s or pre-enlightenment. So I do think that these spate of technologies will change what all those people in cities, their core perception of the world, not what we are as humans, uh, but, but how in the environment we react, how we think about things, and how we view our, our place. Um, and so those concepts I think we don't know. And we will change as, as, at least as much as, as humanity's perceptions have changed in the last couple hundred years. So I, I, I think that's almost a given. And the question is, how soon can we make that marriage? How soon and how much can ethics and governance be built into the digital challenges today? Um, and uh, that, I think, is a question partly of ethics and, and governance, but partly as consumers and citizens. You know, right now we're starting to question technology or its impact, but in a way we're still giddy and we're still addicted. And so the idea of if something X were to go away, however worried we are, we'd probably be like shocked and, and uh, it'd probably be difficult for governance to, to take away the capabilities of society today. And so I think it probably takes a generation at least to really understand what technology is. Uh, and I think there are questions, does the current generation get trapped, especially with data and data mining? Like eventually we'll have to have a system where just because something exists, we don't trust it. I mean, video is not, I mean, you, you can make anything in a digital setting. So yes, we have some history of what you did when you were 18 and it was lousy. What does it mean for your job and your life? Like those systems we don't have yet. Um, in 100 years, we probably will, but, but how does the generation in the middle, or the generations in the middle of that process, um, will be kind of living with some of the negative consequences and trying to build ethics and systems and governments and law and products and you know, s cultural values about how we deal with those things? What is your opinion, Mr. Fletterly? Well, I mean, since the invention or discovery of fire to the invention of Bitcoin, uh, technology has always had these two faces, right? It has been used for good by humanity or, or it has been used for bad. And so it's a responsibility of society to decide what to do with technology. As scientists and engineers and technologists, you know, we can lay out the possibilities, but it's for society, for civil society, please note the difference, for civil society to establish the governance for these new technologies. What I am very astonished about, I'm sorry to have to say, is how far uh, private enterprises have taken over the space of digital, this digital space, um, sort of with very few boundaries uh, on ethical issues, on morality, on, you know, are we doing this for the good of humanity or for shareholder values? And we have been so far that it's just flabbergasting what I see every day showing up in terms of you know, breach of privacy, misuse of data, and so on, to the point that the foundations of modern society, or that is democracy, has been put in danger. And I think it's high time that politics and the civil society takes back this space. Mrs. Hirayama, uh, do you agree with what we've heard so far? I think uh, it's always uh, difficult to predict where new technology takes us. And it's worth uh, remembering a huge mistake uh, by Thomas G. Watson, former head of IBM, who predicted in 
1943 that there might be a need uh, for five computers worldwide. So even he made a completely wrong prediction, um, IBM became a very successful computer company. So this means it's important uh, to be open, to be flexible, to have uh, the best skilled uh, people, not only to follow technology, but to drive technology and, and to use it. Coming back to uncertainty, also this is not new, looking at the last uh, industrial revolutions, uh, society also had uh, to deal with a lot of uncertainty. So beginning of the 20th century, 40% of uh, the employment was in agriculture, today it's 3%. So um, it's not that this 37% uh, uh, is unemployed nowadays, but we have different jobs and uh, different uh, demands, and this is where education plays an important role. So our uh, compulsory education, professional education, and university education, they are very busy, not only right now, but also right now, with uh, identifying the needs uh, of the future, um, the um, skills which are necessary and uh, I'm quite positive that our young generation will have a very good education also for the future to be fit and to drive uh, the digital transformation. But we also have uh, the older generation, 40 plus, and uh, here in Switzerland uh, we are uh, European champions in continuing education. So about 70% of uh, the persons between 25 uh, and 65 uh, participate in a continuing education each year. That's really a lot and this is important, but these are mainly people who already have a good education and the ones who don't, they usually do not participate uh, strongly in, in this kind of, uh, of things. So we really have to work on this. And uh, I think it's a key factor to enable the society to understand what's going on um, to, to deal with the uncertainties. Professor Floridi, I'd like to address a question to you. We are trying to teach machine ethical behavior. Do human beings always act ethically or is there an ethical answer in every possible situation? In other words, <laughs> can ethics be universal? Yeah. <laughs> well, we it would be nice if we could teach machines to be ethical. Uh, we have failed so far uh, to teach humans to be ethical, so I, I have very little hopes for machines. Um, but there's normally a, an important point to, a serious point to be made there. Sometimes people, uh, you see a confusion between what is an ethical principle in, in say, uh, um, product design. Sometimes what we're really talking about is safety. Now, safety can be ethical, can save lives. So the, the design of a microwave is universal everywhere, from Tokyo to Los Angeles. If you open the microwave, I've tried that so many times, it always stops working, which is great, because you can't burn your hand in it. Now, that design is a safety design. Is it ethical? Well, I mean, yes, it's a good thing. It should happen, but it's the minimal bare design requirement, something that should never happen. The microwave will always stop. Now, it's that what we're talking about. Well, we can do a lot of good design of minimal requirement so that these machines, whatever they are, AI or not, they don't pass that particular boundary. But that, once again, is the minimal requirement. Can they discriminate between a kid playing with a plastic gun you know, in, say, somewhere, say, uh, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a difficult context, shall we say, maybe Northern Ireland, you know, given the topic today, and, um, or, or a real gun? I wouldn't trust a machine ever, but I wouldn't trust a human either. I would trust much more a human with a machine. The best chess player is a grandmaster with a computer. <laughs> That's the best chess player ever. That's unbeatable. So the combination of the two, I think we can teach machine and humans to work together to improve the ethical standards, definitely. But I'm afraid we're not going to close hell. <laughs> Mrs. Baker, does technology jeopardize democracy? How we can um, we counter this tendency? Well, at the current moment, you can see. I mean, I think the answer, yes, right. 
it, it's very clear now that with social media, it's easy to target and identify individuals, and the data collection is enough that manipulation, you can go beyond prediction to manipulation. So at the current moment, like that's a, that's a significant issue. Uh, and we don't know the time frame of where that will roll out in different electoral politics, but that's clearly one. And, um, but in the bigger question of is that inevitable or can we do something about it, I would say it's definitely not inevitable. I mean, it's two or three years old and clear understanding. Um, in fact, I haven't seen deep, deep analysis of the Brexit votes. I've seen mostly deep analysis of the 2016 US election, uh, plus the Hungarian. So we're, we're just very early in understanding what's happening. And so the chances to make change are really possible. Um, and I think, I'm not sure that it's ethics, but I also think that social convention and understanding also has to grow. I mean, most of us are using recommendation engines. Um, if you're in a social media context and you're following, um, certainly if it's a YouTube kind of video piece, you're clearly being directed every day, right? We just don't really understand that it's happening and what it means now. And so that, that needs to happen. And then I would also go back and point out, you know, the Industrial Revolution was a deeply um, capital intensive and centralizing in period in many ways. Um, and after you got through child labor, you know, and a, and a range of issues, the democracy did expand in that period. So if you look back to what democracy was <laughs> in the 1800s, you know, it's a very, very small group of wealthy landowning men. So, so even in the midst of technical challenges and, and um, the complex environments of the growth of cities, we've seen the rise of democracy as well. But we will not have exactly the same democracy as you know, 1950 or 1900 or pre-World War I, whatever that meant. It will look and feel different. Uh, so society will change exactly what that means and how it works, I think, will be different. But if you take the value of, is the citizenry the source of power in government? And can a citizen express discomfort, dislike, a desire to change government? And is there some connection between that and power? Or you raise your voice. Uh, if you take that broader view of democracy, then I think the possibilities are really quite large. But we are in a moment of trauma and crisis now. Mr. Fetterly, uh, governments all over the world are trying to outplay each other with strategies to foster artificial intelligence. How dangerous is it for Switzerland to stand aside and not to enter this game? I, <clears throat> I must say I don't understand the question because I don't think Switzerland is a side of this game. If I look at the research level in Switzerland in the field of AI, of machine learning, data science and so on, I think we are, you know, very well positioned for a small country, thanks to the support of the Swiss Confederation, the taxpayer in Switzerland, which pays for a fantastic public research and education system. I would like to publicly acknowledge this because it's not the case in many other countries, okay? Public support for <laughs> <laughs> free education, okay? Yeah, you, yeah. you know, Mitchell, what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> We're both in Berkeley, and uh, the US has a little bit of a challenge there. So, the research level is very good. It's actually documented quantitatively in these rankings and so on. But it's true, we have to keep doing it, and we have to keep looking for the right applications of these fields, and also help other science fields and society at large to use actually state-of-the-art data science, AI, and so on, to solve what are the problems of the day. And I really liked uh, what Professor Floridi said. Probably the biggest challenge for society is not so much you know, AI, not AI, it's about global warming and how to use the know-how we can generate, uh, the data that we have access to, to actually address exactly the most pressing problem for civilization in the 21st century. Uh, Mrs. Ayama, your state secretariat is preparing a report on artificial intelligence and I imagine that legal issues figure in it as well. Uh, do we need more regulation with regard to digital transformation or is self-regulation the better way? It's important to find a good balance between regulation and self-regulation. Like our president uh, said before, there is a need for regulation, but we have to be careful not to regulate too much. So we should only regulate when it's really necessary. We should find a technology neutral way for regulation, that we are open for innovation, for new technologies, and 
this is uh, for sure not an easy question to find a good way to do this. Preparing this report um, for artificial intelligence, it's not all about regulation, but it's also about the topic, what's going on in Switzerland, what's going on in administration, and where could the administration use uh, artificial intelligence? So uh, we want to go a step ahead in this direction. It's very important to have the exchange with all the different federal offices because we also heard uh, before everybody is working on his own. So we have a lot of uh, potential to work together and to go ahead uh, together in the administration. And uh, yes, also to be a good example uh, for the private companies uh, and so I'm quite uh, optimistic that we will be able uh, to publish the report uh, by the end of the year. So where do we need to take action? What is more urgent? It's a, a question to both of you, also to Mr. Fetterly. In, you mean in the uh, artificial exactly, intelligence? Yeah. I, I think what, what is really important is that we um, have an environment which is open, which allows innovation, uh, which respects the autonomy of uh, the institutions, the universities, uh, the funding institutions. And uh, we, we, we need uh, to support the, um, the transfer of knowledge uh, between universities uh, and companies, uh, not only to have good research, but also to use the results uh, which are produced and I think this is very uh, important. And of course, we need to have regulation, but it's not all about regulation. And I want to state our president again, we also have to be willing to take some risk, not to be crazy, but, but to take some risk. We cannot regulate everything to the end, then we will kill all innovation. So um, as running one of the two institutes of technology in Switzerland, we have to be sure that we are able to attract the best talent to Switzerland, be it professors or students, because to be competitive in research, especially in a field that is so competitive like AI and data science, um, we have to be very, very attractive. That's number one. That means, of course, we have to have enough funding for doing that research, but it also means we have to be open, for example, with respect to the European research programs, where we compete for the moment very, very well. It also means we have to collaborate across Switzerland so that uh, the resources we have, it's a small country, we have to make sure the networks in Switzerland work very well, that we don't reinvent the wheel or compete against each other. I'll give just one example. The two ETHs together have started the Swiss Data Science Center very successfully, which is a disposal of the entire research community and uh, actually also industry to help people with data to actually achieve uh, you know, knowledge extraction using, for example, AI. And uh, with all this together, you know, at the end, it comes out of this very, very good uh, working conditions in Switzerland that make the country very attractive and keep a leadership position. Uh, Mrs. Rayama, what determines with technology prevail in Switzerland? Is, is the market, what is the role of the public authorities? So, as I mentioned before, it's uh, very important that uh, our research uh, system can work in a creative, open, internationally collected way. And uh, so, of course, the market is very important because at the end, uh, um, new technologies have to be used and have to be accepted by the market. But in the beginning, uh, new technologies are developed and uh, maybe um, in the first uh, steps it's even not clear what they can be used for. So we really need uh, the research activities, the basic research at the universities and the knowledge and uh, technology transfer to the companies. And here we have in Switzerland uh, a good system with the universities, the universities of applied sciences, two funding institutions with the Swiss National Science Foundation and InnoSwiss so that we can really support uh, basic research um, to application with all the uh, technology transfer uh, which is uh, necessary. But in the end, of course, the market is very important. 
Mitchell Baker, uh, is it inevitable that citizens have to forego privacy in order to make the most of digitization? As asked, I'd say no. Um, but I, I would say w we are coming into an era where sensors are cheap. Right. And so the amount of data about the environment and about us that will be available and transmitted is going up. Right, r right now what we're focused on is, uh, in large part, what our phones are sending about us, how our experience, particularly on social networks, but really any app you're using on your phone, usually it's a data gathering mechanism, um, which then gets sold. So we have that piece, and I think, no, that's where we've ended up. Um, there's a separate piece, which is um, just the ability to capture and transmit data is going way up. Right? You know, every chair, every shoe, you name it. You know, within, I don't know, Moore's Law, I can't even tell you how quick a time it will be. You know, the ability to gather uh, easy information. Why is your shoe not gathering information about your posture? You know, if you've had surgery, I mean, so it, it's a small example, but, but these kinds of information flows are going to go crazy. You know, uh, and so what we do with them and how we regulate them, where they go, these are going to become bigger questions. Like, in a sense, the social media is the first of many examples that we'll see. So <laughs> trying to get it a, a better balance in, in today's privacy issues is really important just for today, but also because more is coming. And so I don't think it's inevitable. I mean, we have a, a, a certain business model, which is, you know, we have two things now that it, there's this sense and desire and even pressure to have your personal brand. Who's paying attention to you? Who's following you? Like, how do you communicate with people? And all of that material is now sold and monetized. So like the whole of human experience is the business model right now. And so that's a piece that um, we should experiment with whether that's the right one and whether we should break it. And so that's why I say some of those may be regulatory and others of those are our own experience as human beings and citizens. Is, is that uh, over time, is that sense of personal place in the world and that it has to be public um, really the right way for all of us to be living. Mm. Well, I, I completely agree. And I think that um, the somewhat we missed the boat uh, of establishing a better digital environment. I'm going back to uh, what you were saying, uh, roughly in the 90s, we, we misunderstood all this technology for another stage in communication technology. We did not realize that we were building a new environment. We thought it was TV, radio, newspapers, Alphabet, Gutenberg, plus. And all of a sudden, uh, we thought, OK, well, let's this market develop. This was in the 90s, yeah. Clinton administration, and so on. And then we will regulate, as we did in the past. I mean, it was easy you know, to see things that way at the time. Uh, some people, a few of us, and academics and so on, we saw this differently. Now that we have realized, finally, that this is not a communication-only device, it's something that you live in. So I don't live on TV, but I live on life. I live on the web. I spend hours you know, in that particular environment. Whoever builds the environment owns the space. And now that space is owned by private companies. So that mistake has been made. How much we can reverse that mistake, it's open to debate. Certainly, in my view, regulation is essential. Now that we have all this data floating you know, all over the place, being collected at every corner, any time, by everybody, not just companies, but also governments, including you know, in my own country, back in the UK, more CCT cameras than you can possibly imagine per person. Surely, what you want to make sure is, what are you going to do with the data? Because maybe we can stop the flow of the data going, maybe not, I don't know. But surely, we can do a lot about what happens to the data once they are collected. And that's why we are in a good position around this you know, corner of the world in, in Europe with the GDPR and everything else. Now, that is good news, implementable, perfectable, everything can be done you know, once more better, but definitely the right direction because you want to make sure that, okay, maybe you collect the data, maybe I cannot stop you from not knowing how many T-shirts I bought and where I had my dinner, but I'd like to know whom you're giving to, what you're going to do with that, are you manipulating me through those data, am I being incriminated, misjudged, with this data. That is essential and is in our power. So that train has not been missed. 
And that's where I would like to stress you know, what the things that have already been said before, like regulation, self-regulation, we don't have to choose. We can use both. So we can say self-regulate, and insofar as you don't, we will regulate you. Uh, that seems to me the future. We, we can do this, uh, because that's the power of politics over business. Yeah, let me just um, elaborate on that one. You mentioned GDPR. Um, it's amazing that Europe actually took the lead on GDPR, and finally uh, other countries will, will follow. This, I think, is extremely important. It shows that actually uh, you know, data being produced in a country like Switzerland is actually owned by Swiss citizens. It's not owned by you know, some random private company. And so to think about issues like privacy, about who owns the data, uh, who can market the data and so on, these are the fundamental questions. We need to have a digital market that functions, but where citizens, you know, users are not simply the product, which is what happens now. Um, I'm an optimist, okay, so I think it's not too late, but we have to be extremely careful to make the right decisions now for Switzerland, for Europe, ultimately for the world. May I add something? So the conventional wisdom in the tech industry for I don't know, 10, 20 years has been that people talk about privacy but don't care. And that you can build a privacy product but it won't succeed. Uh, and that's not just Silicon Valley, that was throughout Europe, including Germany, you know, where the, the, at least the public expressions of privacy are high. And I believe that that is starting to change. Um, at least we're starting at, at Mozilla to see signals in the market that consumers actually pay attention and given a choice and an understanding will make different decisions. This is new. And the, so the connection to the GDPR is that um, it both sends a signal about governance and law and required compliance, but it is another signal from society that the values of privacy or personal security are becoming market forces. And that would be a phenomenal change. So this is partly a plea, you know, at Mozilla we try to make product, um, but a plea that if you see or experience or find products that have privacy characteristics, even if they're narrow, like as consumers adopt those, it sends a signal to the market that this is actually a time when security and privacy features that are real in products will be accepted. And I think that's a key piece of the cycle because we need these products, even if they're niche products, to start to demonstrate what's possible. So I'll, I'll give one example, only one, because I don't want to be a commercial. Uh, but, but we have a, a feature for Firefox users that restricts the ability of Facebook to track you as you travel around the web. <clears throat> so it's not an alternative to Facebook in any way, but it, it, it limits the data that Facebook collects. So the signal of the number of people who use that is important to us. It, it's, a, it's an extension currently, so it's, it's, very, it's the fastest growing extension we've ever had. So now we start to get data points for the design of products that say something that's focused on privacy and security will actually be adopted in society. And that, that those are investment signals into the market and into you know, new companies. So I want to encourage you, you know, sometimes they feel small or you know, not worth the time, but, but those market signals are really key. And that's how we get the examples of what's possible and how you could regulate well. And it's very hard to regulate when there's nothing out there that points the way for you. But as we get these products, even if they're not used by hundreds of millions of people, if they're used by tens or a hundred million people and they work well, that is a real helpful element in how to regulate something effectively. Thank you very much. Please. We very often talk about technology, but uh, the aspects of how to use that data, um, that's not about technology. So humanity is playing an important role in this uh, discussion we really have to have in our society. And also we have to consider the different culture. So um, it's important that we have a discussion in Switzerland, but that we also have a discussion uh, in the international uh, context with the international organizations, and we have to find ways, um, yes, how to use uh, 
this uh, value, but uh, also we have to find the limits and probably the definition for this will not be the same in all countries uh, of the world. We still have a few minutes left. I'm wondering if the young people have a question. Tama, do have our young audience also a question to address to our guests? <laughs> of course. <laughs> My microphone, thank you very much. Yes, of course, we do have a question, but before I get to the question, I would like to get back to our survey we had at the beginning before you uh, started the discussion. Um, I asked the people whether they believe that the power of machines will make us humans feel less powerful. And the answer was 70% um, say no, only 29% of the audience thinks yes, it could indeed feel us powerless. And the question is also connected to the one our youth has, um, which will also be discussed in their presentation later on. The question is, how do we make sure that we keep the control over the algorithms before they take over control over <laughs> us? Who would like to answer? <laughs> Mr. Fetty would like to start. Well, make sure you, you can always pull the plug. <laughs> so more seriously, I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and Professor Floridi said it very well. It is for society to decide which algorithms are actually running. Right now, we are just in sort of a blind mode where we are sort of society at large is not aware of what is really happening. This is sort of a no man's land where companies have made huge progress, very interesting technology, without really society understanding that you know, the rug was being pulled under their feet. Uh, you know, data is a new oil, but who owns the oil? It's not us who provides the data. You know, what we do with it, done by algorithms, is interesting, but we should be in the driver's seat of what we really want. I think it's a question of, I call this digital maturity, which means that the society has to understand what is happening. This happened with the first industrial revolution, it's happening now. This is also related to education, so that the population at large understand what is going on, and then take the right decisions. Thank you very much indeed. I think you need to go to uh, Geneva, Mr. Fettel and Mrs. Baker. Thank you very much indeed for this conversation, and thank you to Tama for this question and the young audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Und jetzt übergebe ich das Wort an Tama. Vielen Dank, Jada. Also, die Algorithmen werden das Ganze nicht übernehmen, aber jetzt werden die Jungen übernehmen. Auf diesen Teil habe ich mich schon den ganzen Tag gefreut. Das wird richtig gut. Wir haben sehr ähm, gute Speaker jetzt gehabt und jetzt kommt ein bisschen Druck auf für junge Menschen, die noch nie vor so einem großen Publikum da waren. Deshalb brauchen wir.